Hello, everybody. Steve Edelman here, founder and director of Taking Control of Your Diabetes. As you can see, I'm calling, signing in tonight from my very neat office. Uh, welcome to our Spotlight Series. We have an exciting night tonight, and I am going to share my screen and take you through a few introductory slides. We're going to get right into the program. Um, the first thing I would like to do is show you that, um, let, me, let me put this on the full screen. Okay. There we go. We're going to have Dr. Schaefer Bader uh, speak on cardiovascular disease, a very important topic that affects both people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. He's going to be followed immediately by Jennifer Troop, uh, coming all the way from Missoula, Montana, to talk about a heart healthy diet. Um, both these individuals, they don't have diabetes themselves they pretty much have devoted their careers to people living with diabetes. Then from 5 to 5.30, we will be having a Q&A session. I'm going to be taking notes. I'll be scanning through the Q&A tab. Uh, important note, do not put your questions in the chat function. Go there if you're looking to hook up with someone tonight. Uh, and so then right after that, very importantly, um, we're going to have a, a health fair. And I'm going to talk about that again in a second. Just a couple of quick announcements. Facebook Live next week uh, on diabetic retinopathy and macular edema, an issue that I had myself, I have myself, once you have it, it doesn't go away, but it's under control by a very good ophthalmologist named Blake Cooper, who has a daughter with diabetes as well. Then on October 3rd, our big one conference for people with type one diabetes. We've already got almost 2,000 folks set up and we're using an incredible platform called VFairs. You ready for this? This is what it's gonna look like when you go into the lobby and you'll have an exhibit hall, an information center, an auditorium, and a networking lounge. So this is just one example. And these little avatars will be moving. They won't just be standing there. And uh, maybe you can find yourself in there. Um, for you healthcare professionals, also on October 3rd, uh, you'll have your own continuing medical education program. You'll be able to use the health fair and visit the health fair just like all the rest of us with type 1 diabetes. Of course, anybody's interested to attend. If you have type 2 and you're interested in type 1, uh, it's complimentary, so please come and join us. Now, the next conference, the TCOID conference, where we're going to have a type 1 track and a type 2 track, that's going to be November 7th. Mark your calendars. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to our corporate sponsors who help support everything we do at TCOID. Now, um, I also want to thank No Diabetes, your, but No Diabetes by Heart. Uh, it's a collaboration between the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association to raise, to raise the awareness of type 2 diabetes uh, and heart disease. But it also turns out that heart disease is pretty rampant in type 1 diabetes as well, and Dr. Bader will cover that. Now, lastly but not least, um, the, the exhibit hall is open between 5 and 5.30. I'll see you in there. Um, the links to every one of these booths are in your email that you got as a reminder, and it's also in the chat box. So you can just click on the link, visit the booth. There will be folks there to talk to you, uh, answer your questions, and now's a really good time that if, if you're interested in one of these companies, of course, Dexcom is CGM, Abbott is CGM, uh, Lilly makes Trulicity and Vaccini, which is for hypoglycemia, Trulicity is for type 2 diabetes, Insulet, the Omnipod company, uh, Insulin Pump, Regeneron, which is very much related to eye products, and eye health, Sanofi, which makes uh, a great basal and fast-acting insulin. Tandem makes an insulin pump. Mankind, of course, Afreza. And no diabetes by heart if you want to get some information on heart disease. So um, with that, I am going to unshare my slides. And Schaefer, why don't you uh, come on and take over from here? All right. Thank you, Steve. Um, all right. Welcome, guys. So. I, I'm pretty excited to be here today. I want to thank everybody who's joined. We have almost 
200 people so far joining, which is a great turnout, people from all over. So it's a lot of fun to see where you all are from. Um, I'm here in San Diego. I work with Steve. Um, he's been a, a really important mentor um, and a teacher and a friend in, in my life and my career. So I'm fortunate to be here um, working with TCOID, working at the University of California, San Diego. Um, so I'm pretty excited. Um, ah, Mr. Sir, hi. I'm pretty excited to be here. Um, and we're gonna talk today about heart health. This is a, a topic that is, um, first of all, it's very important. And uh, it is near and dear to our hearts. And that's because it affects everybody. And this is something that, um, you know, I'll get into a few of the details, but um, cardiovascular disease is unfortunately the number one cause of death across everybody in the United States. It's number one, more than cancer, more than everything else and um, even more than COVID. And you know, the, it, it's that way for everybody, but it's even worse for people with diabetes. So if you have diabetes, and that doesn't matter if it's type one diabetes, type two diabetes, pancreatic diabetes, your risks for having heart disease are even higher and your outcomes are even worse potentially. And so this topic is important for you, it's important for, for, for me, it's important for your family. And it's really the whole point of this talk is to give you actionable information to, to educate you on what you can do to basically improve your heart health. So that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, let me share my slides here. All right. So, um, as Steve mentioned, um, you know, this is sort of a joint effort between TCOID and No Diabetes by Heart, which is in and of itself a joint effort between the American Heart Association and the American Diabetes Association. So these big organizations really care about, um, you know, improving your health and our health. And this is information that we put together um, to kind of help you do that. So, so I hope if you listen to these slides, what I really want you to do more than anything, I want you to take in as much as you can, of course, but I want you to specifically think about one or two, or maybe at the most three things that you want to do for yourself or your family that's going to improve your heart health. So as, as we're going through all these different things that the ABCDEs of heart health, think about something that you want to actually do, whether it's change your diet, talk to your um, cardiologist or your endocrinologist about a, a heart medication, ask your doctor if you should be on aspirin, whatever it may be. So whatever it is for you, take a couple takeaway items and actually go do those things because that's gonna be the best use of, of this topic. All right, so again, this is the ABCDEs of heart health. And um, Basically, it's outlined this way to help us as a basically a mnemonic to kind of remember these different topics. And you'll see what I'm talking about. The important, that, so the, the good news is, and the whole reason why we do this talk, why we're all here tonight, is that by controlling the ABCDs, you can actually reduce your risk of heart disease, heart failure, and stroke, okay? So this is within our power to actually reduce our risk of, of having these, these you know, bad things that we want to avoid. So that's the good news. This is the empowering news. This is what we're going to talk about for the rest of the night. With the exception of this one slide, which is kind of the bummer slide. You don't have to go through all the details on here, but this is a slide that basically talks about how bad heart disease is. And unfortunately, that it's worse with people who are living with diabetes. So those, um, those who have diabetes, again, whether it's type 1 or type 2, are at about double the risk of, of, of having heart disease and including having bad heart disease like a heart attack or a stroke, cardiovascular disease, compared to the general population where heart disease is already the biggest problem. So this is, a, this is a serious topic, but it's one that we can actually help with, that you can make changes and make your heart healthier. And that's the good news. That's what we're here for. So let's talk about the ABCDs, okay? Do you have a photo? Um, Perfect. And okay, so just to go through them, first of all, um, A stands for aspirin and A1C. Okay, we're gonna get into the details of these. This is just an introduction. B is your blood pressure, C is cholesterol, and D is for diabetes drugs. And then we kind of snuck in an extra one here. 
it's, it's E, and that's for eliminate smoking. So for those who do smoke, um, we'll, we'll talk about it, but it's an important thing to think about. So let's get into the A, B, C, D, E's. So A is for aspirin, okay? Um, really, when we talk about aspirin, we're, we're, in most cases, we're talking about a baby aspirin, an 81 milligram once a day aspirin. And we know we have a lot of information about how this affects the heart health. And we know it's effective. It's very inexpensive. It doesn't cost much. And basically it works by thinning out your blood just a little bit to help reduce the chance of blood clots that can basically clot in your heart or in your brain, which, which lead to potentially a heart attack or a stroke. So by taking a baby aspirin, we can reduce the risk of that. Now who should take an aspirin? It, it, honestly, it's not for everybody. So um, these are folks that really should be on a baby aspirin. People who have diabetes and known heart disease should be on a baby aspirin in most cases. So if you have diabetes and you have a prior heart attack, if you've had a stent, if you have any blockages in your vessels, if you have any peripheral artery disease, any of these vascular diseases, you should probably be on an aspirin. Other, other people to think about being on an aspirin be if, if you're older than 50 and you have diabetes, especially if you have other risk factors for heart disease. So these are things like high blood pressure, a history of smoking, maybe a family history of, of heart disease. So these are all um, reasons that would increase your risk that might put you into that group that probably should be on a baby aspirin. And then we say here, and we're gonna say this a lot, so you'll, you'll hear this refrain, but you know, talk to your doctor, talk to your, your care provider about aspirin. And in this case, um, it's because there are some people who really shouldn't be on a baby aspirin or on any aspirin. And those are people who are at high risk for bleeding. So if you've ever had, for example, a, a brain bleed or a gastrointestinal bleed, or if you are at high risk for falls, there may be reasons why you shouldn't take any medicines that thin your blood. So like everything, there is a risk benefit ratio to consider. And that's why it's worth talking to your healthcare provider. I do want to take a minute to, to, to read out this cartoon because it's one of my favorite ones. Um, the, the husband's in the hospital bed, the wife's at the bedside saying, the doctor said you've been whining about taking a baby aspirin every day, so he's switching you to a crybaby aspirin, which always cracks me up because this is um, something that, you know, this kind of dynamic we see frequently in the hospital and in the clinic. So sticking with A, but moving to A1C. So A1C, of course, um, you know, is a measure of our glycemic control. And as many of you probably know, it basically gives us an idea of where your blood sugars have been over the past two to three months. And um, what you may or may not know is that these, let's see, let me get laser pointer. So every A1C percent should correlate roughly with an average blood sugar or an estimated blood sugar over the past two to three months. So if you look at this A1C of 7%, that should correlate roughly with an, with an average blood sugar of 150. That includes all night, all day, um, all takers. And so, um, you know, as the A1C goes higher, then obviously that will correlate with a higher average blood sugar. So this is why this number is important. What is also important to know is, A, what is your A1C? What's your most recent A1C? And B, what is your goal A1C? So the, the American Diabetes Association and many other organizations have sort of a general guideline that we'd like to have people's A1C less than seven because that would mean their blood sugars are generally 150 or below that. It's a safe place. It reduces the chance of having eye disease, kidney disease, and nerve damage. Um, but that number is not right for everybody. So some people should have an A1C goal that's a little higher, maybe 8%, sometimes even 9%. So, you know, what is your A1C and what is your A1C target are two numbers that, um, I, you know, I suggest you to, if you don't know it, then that would be a, something to bring up to your doctor next time you see them. Moving on, let's talk about blood pressure. So blood pressure, another thing where you have to kind of know your own numbers, right? Again, it's a question of where does your blood pressure run and what is your blood pressure targets? What's your goal? Uh, blood pressure is generally measured when you go see the doctor. And so they should tell you that when you, anytime you go into the clinic. Now, unfortunately, a lot, especially during COVID, people may be going to the doctor less often. 
Plus, sometimes when you go into the clinic, your blood pressure is higher than it runs normally just because you're nervous and you're worried about the doctor's going to yell at you or whatever it is. And so it's a good idea, um, if, especially if you've ever had any high blood pressure or if you're on blood pr pressure medications, to get a blood pressure cuff and check your own blood pressure at home. Write down those numbers, check it a couple times a week at different times a day, keep track of those. And then when you actually go in to see your doctor or if you have a telemedicine visit, you can tell your doctor what your blood pressures are running. And that'll be really important information for them when they can't check it because you're not in the clinic. So get a, get a home cuff, electronic cuff, and keep track of those at home. Uh, on average, if you look at this chart, a normal uh, blood pressure is considered to be less than 120 over 80. So that's 120, that's the top number systolic, over 80, which is that bottom number, the diastolic number. So if you're 120 or 80 or below, that's very good. Um, as it gets higher, it becomes increasingly more dangerous. So if it's a little bit above that, you know, in this like sort of 120 to 130 range, then maybe you're okay. Maybe it's something you at least want to ask about. If it gets higher and higher above that, then you're putting more stress on the heart. Every time it beats, it's got to press against that blood pressure. So it wears the heart out faster. That's why over time, um, higher blood pressures can be, can be dangerous. So what's a good blood pressure? Again, talk to your healthcare provider. Know what your target blood pressure is. And with people with diabetes, sort of across the board, a blood pressure less than 130, 120 to 130 over 80 in that range is probably a really good target. So if you're running much higher than 130 over 80, then it may be um, time to think about a medication, changing, changing your diet, losing weight, so that leads us to the next question. What if I have high blood pressure? What can I actually do about it? Well, cutting back in salt is an important thing. As we eat salt, it basically builds up the pressure in our bloodstream. And so cutting back in salt can be really effective for a lot of people who have high blood pressure. So decreasing salty snacks, you know, cutting back the salt that you add to food, looking at the salt labels when you're, when you're eating. You know, switch to more of a, a diet that's high in fruit and vegetables and whole grains. You know, lean proteins are great, lean meats, fish, beans, and nuts. Kind of minimize bad fats, which are like saturated and trans fats. Um, try to minimize added sugar and processed meats like sausages. And then of course, medications play an important role here too. Some of these not only treat blood pressure, but also help protect the kidneys. Um, medications like ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. So that's like Losartan and Lisinopril. Um, benazepril, these are definitely many of the medications that help protect the kidneys. So if you have high blood pressure and you have diabetes, then you, know, you may consider being on one of these medications. So check your medication list, see if any of them are an ACE or an ARB. Um, think about talking to your doctor if your blood pressures are still above goal. And I won't talk too much more about the dietary stuff because thankfully we're, we have Jennifer here tonight, which is I'm really looking forward to. All right, next topic, cholesterol, okay? Here we go, this is a little bit of a refrain, but you have to know your own numbers, okay? So you have to know what your own numbers are, and you have to know really what those numbers mean. So when we talk about cholesterol, um, if you get a cholesterol panel, a lot of times you may know, you may see your total cholesterol, and that number is a little tough to interpret. It's hard to make sense of because the total cholesterol basically combines the good cholesterol and the bad cholesterol, and it gives you in a full, as a whole number. So uh, if that number is a little high, you don't know if it's good, if it's bad, if it's just too high overall. So it's really important to look at the subcategories of the cholesterol. Most importantly, I would say if you knew one number, it would be the LDL. That's the bad cholesterol, the lousy cholesterol. We want to keep the LDL as low as possible, okay? So, so you know, figure out what your LDL is. HDL is what we consider good cholesterol. So it's healthy. And actually, if that number is higher, that's a good thing. So the HDL is the good, the LDL is the bad. There's also triglycerides. Triglycerides kind of fall under the bad category. We don't want them too high, so we want to keep it on the lower side. And actually, if you have good control of your blood sugars, this can help lower your triglycerides. So people who have really high blood sugars that are not well controlled may see that their triglycerides go up too. That number can improve with lower blood sugars. Here we go. Ask your, you know, talk to your provider, get a copy of your labs, keep track of what your your cholesterol numbers are, you probably have to ask for them if they don't give them right to you. But here are some of the goals, right? So here's the LDL, that's that bad cholesterol. And sort of a general goal is to get that under 100. 
But hey, if you have heart disease already, lower is better. And, and so, or even if you just have diabetes and you want to reduce your risk, then you may think about, hey, what is my LDL? Can I get it a little bit lower? Um, and so for some people, a goal of less than 100, some people a goal of less than 70. And it definitely, if it's above 150, 160, it's too high. Um, and, and so that's a number to kind of look out for. The good cholesterol, this HDL, um, higher is better. So above 50, we consider to be protective. It actually helps the heart. If it's less than 40, it's not as protective, essentially. This one's a little bit harder to change, although statins can sometimes help increase this, um, this number a little bit. We'll talk about statins. Triglycerides, uh, less than 150 is a general goal. If it gets higher than that, over, then it will put your heart at increasingly more risk, and it can cause other problems too, like pancreatitis and other things if it gets really high. But again, less than, less than 150 is kind of a general goal. So, you know, talk to your doctor, figure out what your goals are um, and if you're on the right treatments and, you know, and if you're working on the right diet. Okay, let's talk about statins. This is actually a really important topic, I think, because there is a lot of misinformation about statins out there. And there are also some people who just don't do well with statin medications. But that being said, they are one of the most powerful medications that we have to lower the bad cholesterols and to help protect the heart. So they are extremely powerful in terms of protecting the heart and reducing your cardiovascular risk. So who should be on a statin? So anybody who has had any known uh, coronary disease, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, or stroke should be on a statin. So if, you had a, if you've ever had any of those problems, you really need to be on a statin. And if you're not on a statin, then you need to be on a, a, on a strong alternative medication that maybe a cardiologist can help you find. If your LDL is above goal, then again, you should be on a statin if you have diabetes because we need to bring that LDL number down and statins are really good at that. Most patients with diabetes between the ages of 40 and 75 um, should be on a statin. Some patients who are younger than 40 should also consider a statin if they have high risk for heart disease. Again, family history, uh, if they have other issues like hypertension, if they have a history of smoking, then you know, I would think about a statin for that person as well. Um, and then, you know, we say ages 40 to 75, that's really because that's a, this upper age limit of 75 is kind of where the, the evidence is unknown because they haven't done those studies. It's hard to show. Um, so, you know, if I was 76 and I had diabetes and heart disease, would I still take my statin? I personally would. Uh, we just don't have as clear of an evidence. So if you're older than 75, talk to your doctor and, and it'll be a discussion that you guys can have to decide about, right? Um, please, 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 please don't be scared away by some of the crazy information on the internet about statins. They are a very widely used class of medications and, and as more people use them across the world, they become sort of a target for weird information. Um, so just, you know, be careful, just like anything you read on the internet, be careful what the sources are stick to you know legitimate medical sources and if you have if you have concerns talk to your healthcare provider about those concerns so don't you know don't don't keep them secret uh, what about side effects so you know here is this this shows the pharmacist handing uh, a lady the biggest capsule you've ever seen he says it contains her medications plus treatments for all the side effects from her medications side effects are real so um, there, are, there are a percentage of people who don't tolerate statins. They get muscle pains and other problems. So if you're having side effects, or even if you're just worried about having side effects, um, you know, talk with your healthcare provider, right, about those. Because um, don't just stop the medications or you're going to be putting your heart at risk. So if, if, if you're told that, hey, a statin would be good for you to help protect your heart, um, but you're having trouble with side effects, then we need to find alternatives. And that's something that your healthcare provider should be able to help you do. If they can't, if they don't know how to do it, then you, know, you need to see another specialist, potentially a cardiologist or someone like that who, who is gonna be really comfortable with these medications. A lot of endocrinologists use these a lot too and have a lot of other options as well. Um, so, so we just wanna make sure we get you on the right treatment plan. All right, diabetes drugs. Um, so this is kind of an interesting topic. There are now diabetes medications that can, that can lower your risk of heart disease. And there's, we have multiple classes of medications, not just medications, but whole classes of them that actually help protect your heart. Didn't used to be that way. 
So these are all, you know, in the last decade or so, relatively newer medications that have extremely good benefits to protect the heart. So this is exciting news. The cardiologists are excited about it. You know, we are excited about it. And if you have diabetes, you should be excited about these too. So one, one class is called the GLP-1 agonists. Um, I'm not gonna get too much into these medications, but these are some of the brand names, Victoza, Ozempic, Trulicity, Bidurion. So you may have seen commercials for those. They tend to be injectables. They're not insulin, but they're injectable medications. Uh, there is one um, oral option, a pill, that also is a GLP-1 medication that has similar benefits. And then another class of medications are the SGLT2 inhibitors. So again, brand names here, Jardians, Invokana, Farsiga, and some others. These, um, uh, another, a completely different class of medications, a completely different mechanism of action. These are once a day, once a day pills, but they also protect the heart. So, you know, if you have diabetes and you have heart disease, you should be on one of these medications unless you have some strict reasons why you're not on them for some reason. But you really should be on one of these. So if you're not, then it's important to talk to your healthcare provider because you're, you're, you may be missing out on some protection for the heart. Now, if you, don't, if you have diabetes, but you don't have uh, known heart disease, you may still have risk factors that may make these good medications to use. These medications also tend to help with weight loss, they're good medications for diabetes in and of itself in terms of controlling your blood sugar. So, so if you're not on any of these medications, either a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2 or both in some cases, think about talking to your, your provider about them. Of course, we don't want to forget about lifestyle changes, right? This is things like exercise, diet, um, and taking your other diabetes medications to keep your blood sugar at a good place. So the A1C, of course, is another thing that we do care about in terms of protecting your heart. All right, eliminate smoking. So, you know, this um, is one of these things, you know, everybody knows smoking is bad for you. And uh, I think um, it's, that's not a secret. We also know smoking is really hard to quit. Um, so even if you want to quit, it can be really difficult. But if you're someone out there who, who's still smoking, whether it's, you know, cigarettes, uh, cigars, even vaping, um, you know, just take, um, take another thought about that. Um, if you tried to quit before and didn't have success, try again. Most people can't quit on the first time or the second time or even the third time. So keep at it. This is probably um, maybe the most important thing for your health that you can do. So think about smoking um, and not smoking. Think about quitting smoking. If you do smoke, um, you're probably going to save a few bucks too if you can, if you can quit. Um, okay. Again, lifestyle is super important. So, so giving up smoking if you smoke exercise or just moving around um, and, and a healthy diet, which Jennifer is going to talk more about, um, all really important things to do to set the base for a healthy lifestyle. So, you know, starting with, with lifestyle changes and then, you know, mixing in with, with medications are really the recipe to help protect your heart. Good nutrition is extremely important. So I'm excited to, to learn more about that in the next half an hour. Um, you know, these are some examples of maybe not so good nutrition, probably mostly because of the portion size. So that's pretty obvious. Physical activity, um, it doesn't have to be running a marathon. Um, just getting outside moving, physical movement um, is, is really important for your health and for your heart health. So, you know, walking the dog, even if you're just going to carry the little guy, great. Just get outside and, and move. Um, just by the way, in case you're wondering, this does not count. So you have to actually be walking as well, although this is probably good for FIDA. Um, this is kind of a, a Steve Edelman uh, slide, but uh, you know, Steve wanted, wanted to say, if you're gonna try to cross, try cross country skiing, start with a small country. And obviously that's one, a hilarious joke, but two, also it has sort of a good message. And that message is, you know, you don't have to be a, a super athlete to benefit from some physical activity. So if, if you're not currently exercising, but you want to start, you know, working out a little bit, talk to your doctor, figure out something that you can do physical activity that will be safe on your heart. And things like walking, um, jogging, swimming, um, you know, lifting weights, you know, lifting light weights at home, all sorts of different things um, that you can do that are going to help help protect your heart and actually just be good for your body in general. Um, so, so I do encourage you to find something that you enjoy and that you can stick with in terms of exercise or even just physical activity, because being able to make it a part of your life 
and stick with it is probably the most important thing. So we have a couple of knowledge questions, but I'm going to skip these because we are running low on time. Um, the next steps, again, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I hope that you noticed a couple of specific topics or changes or questions that you want to make in your life or that you want to bring up to your healthcare provider. Um, something different in your diet, maybe a new medication, maybe buying a blood pressure cuff and, and keeping track of it at home. Maybe getting all of your lab work so you know what your cholesterol levels are in your last A1C. So these are all things that I want you to kind of think about for yourself. What's one or two or three things that you're actually going to go out and do to help protect your heart? And then um, the next step, you know, start doing those things. Talk to your doctor about how to um, reduce the risk of, of heart disease and stroke. If you've never had that conversation with your doctor, it's probably time. So if they haven't brought it up, um, you know, hey, you bring it up. Say, hey, what, am I doing everything I can right now to protect my heart? I have diabetes, or even if you're a loved one, you don't have diabetes, but you want to protect your heart, you know, same question. Uh, you can ask your doctor for a referral uh, to diabetes self-management education to learn more about medications, lifestyle changes, and all these other parts of this, because it can be overwhelming to figure out how you're going to change your diet, how you're going to exercise, how you can take your medications. So it's good that if you, you know, ask for some help, ask for some guidance. It's, it's a really important piece of this. And lastly, Go check out nodiabetesbyheart.org uh, for some more helpful tips and resources. Also, uh, TCOID website is a fantastic resource. Um, if you have a chance, check out this uh, feedback survey. You can scan it on your phone um, or you can text this at KDBH uh, to the phone number 39242 just to give a little feedback on this talk since, as I said, we kind of partnered um, with uh, the No Diabetes by Heart folks on this talk. Um, and that's all I have. So with that, I will step off and so we can get Jennifer on here. I'm really looking forward to her talk. Um, thanks for coming, guys. I appreciate your time. Hi, everybody. Can you see me? All right. Um... I'll share my screen here. Okay, so um, what we have going on today, um, and thanks uh, Schaefer for that um, great um, intro and kind of update on, on everything going on with heart disease. There's a lot out there. Um, I am Jennifer Troop and I am a registered dietitian and I work in uh, Montana and um, have a variety of experience just working with patients um, with diabetes, um, obesity, heart disease. Um, and I now kind of work for a remote patient monitoring company um, in a new venture. So a heart healthy diet that doesn't have to taste like cardboard. Um, and I, I like this name, I'm not sure who came up with it, but um, I think that's what a lot of people think um, when it comes to heart healthy eating. And it doesn't have to be that way. So before I go into the presentation, we'll look at um, just what are the guidelines right now. Um, there was a recent consensus statement from the American Diabetes Association on heart disease. Um, the goals of nutrition therapy to prevent or treat heart disease. Um, we're going to look at fat, sodium, omega-3s, and sugar substitutes. We're going to look at eating patterns to prevent heart disease. We're going to put all this information into action. We're going to look at meal examples and uh, some final thoughts on where to go next. This is the nutrition consensus statement that I mentioned, which uh, came out in 2019. And it is something that, oh, every about four years, a group of experts in the field of nutrition um, utilize to um, kind of get together and bring together their thoughts based on all the research to give us some kind of guidance in regards to uh, nutrition and the recommendations in folks with type 1, type 2 diabetes and prediabetes. And I, uh, this group of people I, I respect a great deal and, and always look forward to this statement. Um, it really helps me in my practice. So you can see here that we're placing um, saturated fat with unsaturated fat uh, reduces both total cholesterol um, and it certainly benefits cardiovascular disease risk. 
Um, in type 2 diabetes, replacing foods high in carbohydrate with foods lower in carbs um, um, may improve glucose control, triglycerides, and HDL cholesterol. Um, and, and we're looking really using the, you know, unsaturated fats um, and replacing those carbohydrate foods with the unsaturated fats. Um, that is shown to, to be a benefit. Um, as as uh, Schaefer uh, was discussing in regards to blood pressure, um, consuming a, about 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day or a little less, and we'll talk about that in more detail. And then eating a serving of fish, um, particular fatty fish, twice per week. And that's three ounces, and I always go back to my old deck of cards, um, that about three ounces is a deck of cards. So it doesn't have to be a whole salmon, it's three ounces. So what are our goals um, of nutrition therapy for diabetes? And, and that is something we look at when we treat, uh, you know, we help folks with this. And basically there are three, um, and it kind of goes with some of the ABCs and then Ds uh, from Schaefer, but we want to optimize our blood sugars, right? We want, we want to improve and either continue to improve or just maintain our blood sugar control depending on where it is. Um, we want to optimize our blood pressure and we want to optimize cholesterol. So those are our real three goals to protect our heart. So when we look at an eating plan, uh, meal plan, we wanna make sure we're meeting those three goals. Um, and we do also know that nutrition can lower, of course, um, the risk of a heart disease and a stroke um, and your chances of that. And, and it can also lower your blood pressure. And so I like this uh, picture with the heart. Um, it's the kind of saying, you know, you, you, we hold our heart in our hands. Um, and I think there's a piece of our hands also control what goes into our mouth and our hands can control our heart. Um, and, and taking a minute to, to think about that. And, and that's where I'm gonna go later in the presentation of are we thinking about what we eat um, and how many of us are mindful of what we put in our mouth um, and thinking about that. So before I get into that, I want to show you just some examples of the different types of fats. And, and I know Schaefer discussed LDL cholesterol and HDL um, and triglycerides and what those do uh, in the body. But um, just, to, just to point out here the impact that different types of fats have on, um, on our health. So saturated fat. And so this is those, those animal fats typically um, that are found that are I always you know so they're hard at room temperature. I use the example of the bacon. If I cook, if you cook bacon on the stove, if you leave it on the counter, you know at room temperature, it's going to harden. Um, so that's the saturated fat piece, and it that basically those those are those have been shown in research to raise LDL cholesterol, which that's the bad stuff, right? That's artery clogging um, cholesterol, and we want um, that's not what we want to have happen. And so you're going to want to decrease that, and we'll, we'll get into that further. But some of the guidance of the American Diabetes Association is basically less than 10% of our total caloric intake um, should come from saturated fats. So we really want that very minimal. Um, trans fats, and, and these, you know, these, oh, they came about in the 70s when we went to a maybe lower fat, higher carb, and the processing uh, really happened in our food system and our food supply. Um, and and they're, they're made with partially hydrogenated oils. They aren't such a big factor anymore because a lot of the food companies have taken out um, their trans fatty acids, um, but certainly they're found in fried foods, donuts, baked goods, um, and you can see the list there. Um, they're just, yeah, those, those processed foods, and there's a lot of information out there looking at processed and ultra-processed foods in our health, and we want to limit those. Um, and those, those are a, like a double whammy. They increase our LDL cholesterol, and then they decrease our HDL cholesterol, right? So they're increasing the bad, and they decrease the good. So the guidance is we basically really want to eliminate these. Um, but however, there are trans fats that we find in natural sources and that those are not the concern. It's the synthetic man-made trans fats. And to give you an example of those, here's the um, saturated fat. You can see um, before I move on to the good um, in the meat there's so like bacon there. That's, you know, a good source of, of, of that. Um, and then we have our processed um, trans fats, which you can see on the right. And you can see a microwave popcorn, the frozen pizzas, those types of things. So those, those are things we really want to look at um, 
significantly reducing, and like I said, uh, with the trans, we want to look to eliminate polyunsaturated fats. Now, the the uh, the, the goods are going to be below, um, and I usually I don't like to label good and bad foods, but um, for lack of a better word, uh, when we look at fats and choices, uh, we definitely want to look at polys and monos that way. Um, so these are the ones we want more of. Um, so plant-based, they're plant-based oils. Um, and you can see that like, uh, like soybean oil, canola oil, um, they're found in fatty fish, um, they're found in walnuts, um, sunflower seeds, and they've been shown in a significant amount of the research, especially when we re uh, replace unsaturated fat with these, and that's a key there. Let's replace the unsaturated fat, or excuse me, the saturated fat with the polys. Okay, so that we want the, the unsaturated fats to replace the saturated. When we do that, um, we significantly uh, reduce our chances of, of a heart attack or stroke um, and improve our, our lipid levels. And then, so those polys you can see right here are, of course, your salmon is an example, or your canola oil or, or safflower or something like that. Um, so then your monounsaturated fats um, are like your even more plant-based um, strictly, which is your avocado oil um, and your olive oil. And they also reduce LDL cholesterol, um, but they also increase the HDL, whereas the polys mainly reduce the LDL. Um, again, the mono's gonna have it, another double whammy. So they're, I, I kind of put them higher on the list than the polys. And of course, olive oil is one of our best examples of that. Um, but there you can see there are a lot of other choices. So um, just think those plant-based fats and oils uh, and those fish oils are definitely ones we want to do more of. The, the ones that are man-made and um, animal sources, we want to look at decreasing. Okay, so sodium. And that's, um, and, you know, Schaefer mentioned this. Um, it's kind of, it's been interesting looking, you know, and I've, and I think I've been a dietitian for oh, over 20 years, um, scared to say. Um, sodium has been a discussion that we've looked at, you know, where, where is the limit in those types of things? And we really want to look at um, basically 2,300 milligrams a day, which you can see, um, it's about a teaspoon. Um, so not a lot, uh, but, uh, we know that we also see increased mortality in type 1 and type 2 diabetes um, if we go lower. And there's been some recent research and they look at kind of the excretion of sodium and, and the urine um, and they find a higher mortality rate actually if you go too low. So you really need to work with your doctor um, and use caution with this um, with some of the recent research um, regarding your sodium goals. All right, so omega-3s, those have been out there, you know, for years I had patients, they would bring in their bottles of their krill oil and different things um, and wanna, wanna go over those with me and hoping that would be a magic cure. And of course we know there isn't a magic cure, uh, but with omega-3s, there is some evidence um, in one study called, and it's on the bottom there, the REDUCE-IT trial, that two grams uh, twice a day of this eicosapent ethyl, uh, does reduce heart disease, so that's about four grams total per day, actually by 25%, and that's a prescription, it's a placebo, um, that is out there. And there is some benefit with that, but mainly um, it, it can reduce heart disease, and there's definitely some research showing it can help with triglyceride reduction, and, and in general, omega-3s can help in that, in that way. Um, the ASCEN trial uh, really showed no benefit um, in supplementing with one, one gram per day um, of the omega threes in people with diabetes without heart disease, so you know there's some some benefit maybe in just using a gram uh, with triglycerides and then really getting to a prescription strength that may have some benefit. But at this point, it's still the jury's still out a little bit with the omega threes. Um, sugar substitutes. Uh, that's another area I always get questions on, and I'm bringing it up with heart disease because there have been some statements and looking at specifically cardiometabolic risk, um, that risk of high blood pressure, high lipids, um, high, high glucose levels, and you know, do sugar substitutes help or hurt? And there's discussion about do they stimulate appetite or do they reduce appetite? And so certainly you always want to uh, you know, replace sugar-sweetened beverages with you know, water um, and non-caloric liquids as often as possible. And um, also know that when, uh, when used to reduce, 
um, overall caloric intake, um, they can have an effect, but you want to avoid compensating with intake from other foods. And that's something they're really looking at. Okay, well, you know, if I use it in a cake, well, that's, again, you're making a food that's really not very healthy, a little, maybe a little more healthy, but it's still not healthy. And then is there this mentality of, well, I'm using Diet Coke with my hamburger so I can have a side of fries for example, and that kind of mental game we play. So, you know, the jury's still out on that as well. We, at this point, there isn't anything that um, is saying we should not use them and they can if we keep that in mind and are mindful of the fact that they are not, um, that that if we're gonna you know, reduce sugar, fat, um, calories, that we don't wanna compensate with something else. And then the American Heart Association did weigh in on uh, the diet dot, uh, the diet soft drinks, and they did state that there's not enough evidence to determine whether they lead um, to a long-term reduction right now in um, in weight or in cardiometabolic risk. So, the, again, they just the jury's still out. We'll see on that. But I mean, they're they're safe. It's just are they as effective as we think they are in helping it um, with lifestyle change? Um, and then, what are the eating patterns that support a healthy heart? So we look, um, and I, I pulled mainly four out of the research that I've read, um, and I have discussed these before um, at other conferences, but I, there's been a shift, I would say a big shift in those that nutrition consensus statement from the last time I read it and really looked at um, what was being recommended. And I think it's a shift in a good way. Um, and it's a little more, I'd say controversial as well, but the research is there. Um, to, to start making that shift. And so really the four, the four um, eating patterns that um, jumped out as being beneficial, and then there's really two, I would say, uh, from there that really have research to support it um, and make a recommendation. But, you know, of course, vegetarian plant-based eating certainly um, has been out there for a while in, in relation to heart disease. Um, and it, again, there's some strong evidence there low carb eating plans. And those I would say have come to the forefront more in the medical literature than um, four to five years ago. Um, the Mediterranean diet, um, which has been out there and it's one that has stood the test of time um, in the research. And then the DASH di uh, diet, which also has been around for quite some time, you know, the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And um, that is, um, also one that is out there, but it's not as strong as two of them, I would say, at this point in time. And so if we look here, um, just briefly, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about DASH or plant-based eating because the, the research isn't as strong for these two um, as the Mediterranean and really kind of going lower in carb and higher in those mono or unsaturated or those polyunsaturated fatty acids. So the DASH diet, um, Again, if I think a lot of you are familiar, but again, it, it, it includes some meat, it, it includes low fat dairy, it includes you know, whole grains, what you're encouraged to have, um, nuts, legumes, beans, and of course, vegetables and fruits. And so your kind of your pyramid, if you think about it, if any of you remember the food guide pyramid, was based, is based on um, plants, um, the, the beans, the, the, the whole grains, and really looking at the, the fact these antioxidants and these uh, fruits and vegetables um, and the anti-inflammatory um, properties that really can help with reducing blood pressure and, and fighting uh, chronic disease. The plant-based diet, um, which we, uh, many of us are shifting more towards a plant-based diet, and the research is strong in supporting that, except I think there's always that challenge with how am I going to make sure I am getting my protein needs, my iron, those types of things. And that takes some work and planning. So it depends on how much effort you want to put into that. But certainly you can see um, there's a variety of different plant-based um, eating patterns and I'm, I'm not going to go into all those. It is there. Um, I think, you know, the, the vegan, I, I, I really, you really need to work with somebody with that. Um, if you're going to try um, that type of a plan because especially the, the B12 needs, but there's just a lot with that. So you really have to think about that closely. So the, the two that I'm really going to focus on, which have the strongest researchers, again, is the low carb and then the Mediterranean. And with the low carb, um, 
basically between 26 and 44 percent of your total inner energy intake comes from carbohydrate. Um, now in research we know that folks with diabetes typically about 45 percent of your total inner energy intake is from carb. Um, so this depends on how far you want to go with a low carb. Um, but anyway, that it's not too far off. And it's certainly when I've seen folks with diabetes, there's a correlation we know, right, between blood sugars and carbohydrate intake at a meal. Um, it is the most studied eating pattern for type 2 diabetes. It has been shown to lower triglycerides, increase HDL, lower blood pressure. Um, and it emphasizes, of course, vegetables low in carbs, fats from animal foods, oils, butter, and avocado, for example, protein in the form of meat and poultry and fish. Some plants include fruit, more of the high fiber um, berries, for example. Um, of course, they want you to avoid starchy and sugary foods, such as potatoes, bread, sweets, uh, pasta, rice. And then there's also very low carbohydrate diets that go less than 26% of your total calories, almost more of a ketogenic. And, I, and I'm not going to talk about that. And that is really not one I would recommend um, uh, if, in this juncture here. Um, and it's certainly not recommended for those uh, who have kidney disease, um, disordered eating, or if you're pregnant or lactating, it's not recommended. So that's the piece. And I will say there's a variety of low carb uh, meal plans out there, um, but that's kind of the general guidance. And just so you can see, this is just, just, this is just kind of a cheat sheet for you to see that it, depending on the calorie level you're aiming for, and really let's say that 30 to 40% carbohydrate, you can see the grams of carb that you would be aiming for if you want to go lower in carb. Um, I really wouldn't recommend going less than that 30%. So that's kind of why I say that 30 to 40% range if you're wanting to maybe dial that down a little bit more. So um, you can see 90 to 250 grams of carb depending on how many calories you're looking to take in. So um, moving to the, the Mediterranean diet, um, which I feel this has the strongest evidence right now. Um, and it's just continued to stand again the test of time. And we have seen improvements in uh, glucose control. We've seen decreased medications. We've seen um, decreased risk um, and rates of heart disease, um, especially when you enrich it with walnuts, um, uh, nuts, um, olive oil. Um, that then there's even more of a benefit with that. And of course, you know, this is an example right here. Um, you can see the base again is your fruits, your vegetables, your whole grains, your olive oil, beans, and nuts, herbs, spices, moving to fish and seafood, right? Because it is from the Mediterranean region. Um, and then, you know, smaller amounts of poultry, um, eggs, cheese, and yogurt with very limited meats and sweets. In fact, they talk about really meats almost more of an accent to a meal versus the main course. And in Montana, you know, we have. 16 ounce T-bones or higher, right? So that's just something to think about. Um, and of course, wine, water, um, no, I say wine, no, not, you don't drink wine like water, um, but just about five ounces uh, with a meal. And then I always like the bottom of this. And I think that's the piece that the Mediterranean lifestyle adds and makes this even um, a stronger uh, eating pattern is that it, you know there's an emphasis on family, there's emphasis on exercise, enjoyment, those types of things. So um that's the mediterranean plan so if you think about tips with this um you know switch from whatever fats um, you're using to like extra virgin olive oil like switch the butter for olive oil that that's one easy way to start looking at what you're what you're using and make some of these switches eat nuts and olives um, consume uh, a serving of raw nuts every day which is like a small handful uh, be careful with nuts because they can add up um, add whole grain bread, bread or other, you know, grains to the meal. Um, try different whole grains like bul bulgur, barley, couscous, whole grain pastas, things like that. So other tips are, and you can see an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Um, eat less meat, um, you know, choosing lean poultry. And if you remember that deck of cards portion, that's your serving. Um, again, saving red meat for occasional consumption. Um, eat more fish and both canned and fresh are fine. Uh, cut out those sugary beverages um, and replace soda and juices with water. Um, eat less high fat, high sugar desserts. Uh, aim for three servings of fresh food a day and save cakes uh, and pastries for special occasions. Um, really looking at fruit as a dessert. Um, be beginner and each meal um, with a salad. 
um, and then you know looking at experimenting with dark greens or you know kind of whatever vegetables are in season um, add more different vegetables um, extra serving uh, you want at least three to four um, in a day at a minimum um, and you can see over here that some of these legumes, you know, eat at least three servings a week of those legumes um, or beans. And there's an example there, and there's a lot of them you can experiment with, and they're great. Um, and of course, here's the wine. Um, and, and substitute it in moderation for other alcoholic beverages like beer or liquors or liquor or something like that. Um, just rem remembering that the guidance is one drink a day for women, a uh, five ounce glass of wine would be two for men. So just in kind of get, get, getting close to the end here, I wanted to give you some examples since you know I was tasked to, to try and uh, show you that it doesn't have to taste like cardboard um, to eat uh, a heart healthy diet. And with that, um, for breakfast, for example, now what I gave you here is examples actually of actual meals. And then there's the link there to um, the website that has this information. Um, there's a lot of great information out there on the Mediterranean diet um, and ways that you can incorporate it. Um, so this is Avo Tahini toast. Tahini is a type of sesame um, oil, um, kind of a mixture uh, that's used. Um, anyway, avocado toast, I know is big out here in Montana. I'm gonna guess in California, it's, it's very big since avocados are out there um, grown there. They aren't grown in Montana, but we love it here. So that's a great type of breakfast idea. Um, Greek yogurt with fruit. It's another great breakfast type idea. And again, here there's the website um, that has a lot of great ideas uh, in regards to using Greek yogurt. Uh, lunch, a Greek salad. Um, and that's always a great um, a salad, you know, at lunch actually is probably one of my favorite things to do because you don't get that dip after uh, lunchtime. Um, Italian farmhouse soup, um, and that's actually from an Instant Pot um, website. And I know, you know, Instant Pots are super popular. Um, they're fast, they're easy, and a busy at night, you can make something like that um, for the next day. Um, and I just wanted to give you this tip too, as well as using vinaigrettes um, and trying to incorporate olive oil into. Um, your day-to-day -day life. Um, a basic recipe is, you know, just olive oil, quarter cup, four to five teaspoons, red wine vinegar, salt and pepper. And you can see here, there are a lot of different options as to how you can substitute an experiment to make that um, a dressing that, you know, you like and will work well with whatever meal you're preparing. For dinner, um, there's a chicken and bulgur skillet, uh, skillet from Cooking Light. And I have that website there as well. Again, this is on, all Mediterranean style um, meals uh, and recipes. And then there's a Mediterranean olive pasta. Um, and there's a website there as well. So in like whole grain pasta, really, you know, that's really a way I would recommend that you go with this. Um, snacks, mixed nuts, as, you, as I've mentioned, um, a handful of nuts, definitely important to have as, as part of that uh, eating pattern. And there's a, a lot on taste of home in regards to the Mediterranean uh, diet. Um, and the vegetable platter with pesto yogurt. Um, and that again is a lovely, just kind of way to look at a different way to provide a snack or appetizer or something that's gonna meet um, that eating pattern. So in looking at that, um, and kind of wrapping up since we're, I'm almost to the end, um, I think just remember for one, um, you are what you eat. So don't be fast, cheap, easy, or fake. And that's very true in regards to heart disease uh, prevention and treatment and really in all areas of eating, we, we don't want that. So um, just a few other guidelines, uh, make, try to make only maybe one change per week and start with the easiest. Um, when you look at those tips to add the Mediterranean um, eating into your, into your meal plan or if it's increasing your plant-based foods or you know anything on that lines, so think about that. Um, try a new vegetable every week. Um, I know, you know, exercise, of course, and I know Schaefer went over that, uh, but that is a piece of all of this. You can't have the diet without the exercise. Um, and then make your meal social, um, eat slowly, um, take your time, and don't forget about being mindful. And that's a piece I think with the Mediterranean lifestyle as well. Um, there's a lot about mindful nutrition out there, eating mindfully, you can look it up. Um, but there's, and there's a raisin kind of example I've used with, with my patients. Um, but look at why are you eating? Is there a trigger? When? Um, what, what are you eating? How are you eating? How much? Um, where? Um, 
and it just kind of look at those pieces because they're usually, you know, eating, there's a piece of, if we're eating too much, there might be a reason why. Um, so um, just think about those items. And then just lastly, you know, I was, I was tasked with um, trying to create basically the, the case that a, a healthy um, heart diet does not have to taste like cardboard. And I thought I'd just put this picture up here. This was an oldie but a goodie. Um, I ran doctor, into Dr. Steve in San Diego at a, at a conference, a diabetes educator conference quite a few years ago. And I found this in my archives and you can see there's actually one of those Dr. Edelman's um, actually is a piece of cardboard that a picture was on. So I don't know if you can guess which one it is, but um, I thought it would end with that. So um, thank you for uh, listening to me for the past 30 minutes and I'll, I'll turn it over to our moderator. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, you could unhide the, the cardboard. By the way, that was my twin brother. It wasn't really a cardboard. Uh, <laughs> you guys were talking, but the chat room was on fire. A bunch of us are going out for cheeseburgers after uh, tonight's program. And we, we decided everything in moderation. Um, okay. I'm, I got a lot of questions here, and I'd like you to try to keep your answers as brief as possible so we can get through I, all of these questions that I promised we would answer live. Also, to remind everybody uh, that our uh, exhibitors, our exhibit hall is going to be open uh, right after the Q&A session. If you're dying to go in there now, you might try. If they're there, they're there. If they're not, for sure they will be there at 5.30 uh, Pacific Standard Time. Thanks everyone for all your questions. Okay, Schaefer, lots of questions on statins. Uh, a lot of people are afraid to take statins, as you mentioned. Um, they wanna, I, I'd say I'd summarize them all are, what are the clinically relevant side effects? And someone also answered, does coenzyme Q help? Um, and uh, Jennifer, if you have any opinions on statins, uh, just raise your hand and we'll get you in there. But I'm gonna kind of go back and forth with dietary and heart questions. Yeah, I mean, these these statin medications, again, they are one of the strongest medications that we have to lower cholesterol and help protect the heart. But um, there are some people who have real side effects. The most common side effects are muscle aches, and sometimes those muscle aches are relatively mild. And so people can take statins and just and kind of deal with the muscle aches, even though they're kind of a pain. Sometimes in very rare cases, very rare, but it does happen that, that it actually affects the muscles. It's called the myositis. It's a muscle inflammation. And so occasionally if you have really bad muscle aches or you have a myositis, then the statins just don't work for you. So there are people that have that. And those are really the most common issues with statins. And those are the most legitimate, I think, problems with statins. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of sort of weird, um, you know, information about statins causing Alzheimer's or cancer or diabetes itself. And none of those have, have played out. And so um, what we do know is that statins across the board will reduce the risk of heart disease by like 30 or 40 percent. I mean, huge numbers, like a lot. So, so for the benefit that they provide, the risk of these other things that have not been proven, it doesn't, it, it, they're not meaningful. But if you have a specific issue that you've had with, with a statin, and if you've had muscle aches, or you've had any other problems with them, and, and, or maybe if it's a side effect that I didn't mention, but you're concerned that it's from the statin, talk to the doctor about it. Because they're, they're so important for protecting your heart that I would hate for people not to take them just because they're worried about a side effect. Thank you for that brief answer. I think that took 10 minutes. Um, Schaefer, I'm sorry, did you, <laughs> did you answer the coenzyme Q? I'm sorry. Oh, you know, the coenzyme Q, you know, I don't know a lot about coenzyme Q. There is some data that it can be protective for the heart. It's not nearly as strong as a statin, but if you're taking a statin and you want a little extra boost, coenzyme Q is a, is, a, is a pretty safe supplement. So as long as, you know, you've talked with your doctor, it's probably reasonable to add on if it's something that you're interested in. Yeah, and I've also heard that it, it reduces the side effects of statin, the muscle aches. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, Jennifer, there were a lot of questions on low-carb diets, keto diets. So I can just put a couple in together and you can answer them. You know, is the keto diet safe for type one diabetes and is it safe for type two diabetes? And um, when you talk about low carb, what, how low is low? I know I heard you mention 30%, but if someone wants to go lower than that, what, what is safe? 
So that's a that's a good question. I'm trying to be brief and also put a plug in for the type one webinar. I'm doing that talk. I am doing a talk on ketogenic diet, um, intermittent fasting and low carb. But briefly, um, really less than 26% is a very low carb and getting into that keto level. Um, honestly, type one diabetes is not recommended. Um, there is uh, there's been a very small amount of studies, very short term in the literature and the carb amounts are, they're all over the board with what they study. So um, I would caution against it in type one. Um, type two, there has been more research and there's definitely a compelling um, evidence of reductions in medications and glucose levels and action improvements in lipids. But uh, the keto is so extreme. I think, you know, if you're extreme on any side, I, I have a concern. So at this point, I would recommend against it until there is more literature. But the ver the, the low carb that I showed, which is again, it's getting down there, but it isn't put it, it isn't um, inducing um, the ketones and nutritional ketosis, which is different than ketoacidosis. But I, I just get nervous with that with the literature. We just we just need more evidence before we can really make a recommendation. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Schaefer, there was a this one. This is a tough question to answer. Um, you know, every time someone turns on the news, diabetics are more risk for heart disease. Is that risk the same for type one and type two? And uh, what if can you can you mix everyone together? What if is there higher risk groups and lower risk groups? Like if you have hypertension, if that hypertension is uncontrolled, does that take you out of that high risk group? So it's a tough question, but it's an important question. You can't lump everyone together. No, I think that's very true. And, and, you know, for the sake of this talk, obviously, I, we did lump everyone together. Not everybody is the same. Type 1 is a, is a different disease than type 2. Um, some of the risk factors, so I would say 95% of what, of what we talked about today is true for everybody. And again, even people who don't have diabetes, you know, if I wanted to reduce, I don't have diabetes, as Steve mentioned, you know, I want to reduce my, my risk for heart disease. I have the exact same list of things to, to check off, make sure my cholesterol is good, make sure my blood pressure is under control, eat well, et cetera. Um, the one, you know, difference is that, you know, I don't have to watch my A1C. So it, we know that the A1C number, if it goes higher, whether you have type one or type two will increase your risk for heart disease. So that is an important number um, or just your average blood sugar control control. So if you have a CGM or if you're monitoring with, you know, finger sticks at home and you know, kind of where your blood sugar is running, you know, the lower, the better for those numbers, as long as you're not having hypoglycemia, um, which is another question we could talk about, but, um, basically type ones and type twos are not the same type twos are more likely to have some of these other things like, um, being a little overweight, um, having, having blood pressure problems, having higher cholesterol that just comes with type two, unfortunately. Um, and, and all of those things together increase the risk in type two in type one diabetes. You can have any of those things as well, just like people who don't have diabetes, but it's, they're a little bit less common. So they're not quite as tied together. What's really weird about type one. And I know this isn't a short answer, but again, it's a complicated question. The weird thing about type one diabetes is that there are, there's an increased risk of heart disease even if you don't have any of those other problems. So if, you, if, you're, if you're normal weight, you're skinny, you don't have high cholesterol, you don't have high blood pressure, and all you have is type one diabetes, you're still at higher risk for heart disease and heart attacks and stroke. And so it, it's this kind of, it is a bummer that comes with type one diabetes. It's research actually that Jeremy Pettis and I work on, and we think it has to do with insulin resistance, which is something that comes with type one diabetes. We don't talk about it too much. Um, insulin resistance is something that we think about in type two diabetes, but it's in type one diabetes too. So, so even if your A1C is great, you still may have some of that insulin resistance. And so that your risk may never go completely down to what it would be with someone who doesn't have diabetes, unfortunately. So it's still important to think about all these things and be on the right medication. Yeah. Well, you know how to bum people out with type one. Um, well, I would just say, um, it's just important to address all these cardiovascular risk factors with your doctor, make sure they're under really tight control. Okay, Jennifer, um, there, this is a couple of questions put into one. Someone asked about the plant-based diet. I'm not sure if, if that goes along with someone asking about a strict vegetarian diet. And um, I'll add the third part in there. Uh, there's a local uh, hamburger place called the Burger Lounge. They have a paleo burger and it just comes with a big piece of meat, avocado, even bacon, and some other uh, vegetables. And so, you know, I don't know if you spoke about paleo. If you did, I'm sorry, I missed it. 
Yeah, no, I, I didn't because the literature um, was not compelling in regards to type one and type two diabetes and preventing heart disease. Um, so there's just there just isn't much as, uh, in, in uh, is plant, a is population. Plant based is it vegetarian? Sorry. Yeah. Well, you know, so I think it can be a variety. You're moving towards a plant-based. I mean, I think you can like, yes, vegetarian. I, I would put those in the same category, but then like you have vegan, right? Which is no meat, no dairy, no meat whatsoever. And so, I mean, as far as plant-based, yes, and, and as I mentioned, and, and it, it, there's a lot of compelling evidence for plant-based um, diets. And I feel in a way Mediterranean as well as um, kind of the, the lower carb, um, meal plans can also be that way if you do that correctly yeah you know I, I think you always want to watch you know the bacon the uh, all those types of meats however there is one study actually and i probably shouldn't even say this that that did show that uh, an increase in unsaturated fat with reducing carbs there was a benefit um in regards to uh, triglycerides and some weight loss but you know, I, I, there is some evidence out there and absolutely moving plant-based is a wonderful idea. I just would really caution again against eliminating meat sources uh, completely. Uh, you want to make sure you talk to your doctor and work with the dietitian if you're going to do that. Well, doctors don't know anything about that. Ask your dietitian. Uh, oh, okay. okay, Schaefer, um, this is another important question. A lot of questions about these new diabetes drugs that protect your heart. I think you can give a little more information on to categorize uh, kind of the general improvements like SGLT2s and heart failure and, and so forth. Yeah. But just to let everyone know that uh, the, the guidelines that they give us uh, doctors to use these drugs in which order really depends on if you have heart disease or multiple risk factors for heart disease. Okay, shoot. Yeah, so, and, and I saw there was a question too, which I should have pointed out. Again, I'd say 95% of, of what I talked about is equally relevant to type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Um, these diabetes medications that we're talking about now, the GLP-1s, uh, you know, uh, Victoza, Trulicity, or the SGLT-2s like Invulcana, um, Jardians, these medications are currently only FDA approved for type 2 diabetes. So this is kind of, you know, this is a, a situation where the type 1s kind of get screwed over. They don't generally have access to these medications. Some endocrinologists and even some primary care doctors may prescribe those medications to people with type one diabetes, what we call off label, basically saying, hey, the FDA hasn't approved these for type one diabetes. We think they may benefit you. Here's the risks um, that may come with the medications and the potential benefits. So, you know, some people with type one diabetes do, do use these medications, but they're really approved for type two diabetes. Um, the GLP-1 medications, when we're, you know, what Steve's talking about, when we're thinking about prescribing these medications, you know, really they should be individualized for you. So not everybody gets the same medications. So if you come in, you have diabetes, and maybe you have a history of coronary artery disease, maybe you had a prior heart attack, for example, or you had some blockages or a stent put in, then the strongest, best medications uh, to add in, in, in terms of diabetes meds are the GLP-1 medications. They're really good for protecting that type of heart disease. Now on the flip side, if you if you've had heart failure, so you maybe you have some fluid overload, you have some heart failure, you've had issues like that, then the SGLT2 medications like Jardians and Vulcana, those are the best medications to add. So you know, just saying, hey, you have heart disease even doesn't really get to the full picture. So those are some of the specifics. Um, both of the classes of medications probably also have some some renal, some kidney protection benefits. But that again is stronger in the SGLT2 medications. So for people who have some kidney disease, people who have heart failure, the SGLT2 medications really should be part of part of your list of meds. Wow, thank you. Um, yeah, it's a complicated area, but it is a tremendous advance because not only are we looking at blood pressure, cholesterol, be on a baby aspirin or some type of blood thinner if you're a candidate for it, but now we have diabetes drugs that also improve kidney function as well as heart disease. So. Okay, uh, Jennifer, this is an important question. Uh, you know, everyone's always talking about salt restriction, especially if you have blood pressure. If you have diabetes, you're kind of salt sensitive anyway. Someone said, how do you track the salt in your diet throughout the day? I mean, because there's food labels, and then how do you know the serving size? I mean, it, you know, what do you, I don't have, any, I don't even have an, a clue to start. Well, you know, and you get to be, I always say probably like my engineers or accountants that I would see probably are the ones that would really do this. Um, 
I, I God bless you for trying. I don't, I can tell you, I wouldn't want to do it. Um, yeah. So, right. You look at the serving size on that food label and you're going to look for the milligrams of sodium. So remember, we're looking about, you know, 2,300 milligrams of sodium in a day. So, right. Um, let's say there's a hundred milligrams of sodium and a half a cup of um, some food that I'm eating. If I have a cup of it, right, that's 200 milligrams of sodium. Um, and then we know, as, as I mentioned, a teaspoon of salt um, has about the 2,300 milligrams right there. So what you have to look at um, is, I, you know, some guidance I've always given is taste your food before you salt it. Um, go unprocess as much as possible. So aiming for fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, if you use canned, you know, try to use frozen or fresh versus canned. If you do use canned, rinse it. You can rinse about 40% of the sodium off of that food with that. Um, so I always encourage folks just to choose kind of more of the unprocessed foods. And then, yeah, certainly if you do have something that comes in a package, take a look at that label uh, because yes, there's a little bit of natural uh, sodium in food, but not like at all the processed foods. And then you can, you can meet that guideline pretty easily if you do that. If you shop at Trader Joe's, that means it's not processed. Mm, good question. I, you know, I, we don't have a Trader Joe's here, but uh, I have been to one, and no, you you, you got to read the food label. You just got to read that. You do have to read it and take a look and see what's in there. A quick word about salt substitutes. Uh, my only comment with those is sometimes they have a lot of potassium, and you know, if you have kidney dysfunction, you got to be careful. Like Mrs. Dash, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I would recommend Mrs. Dash and just, you know, using herbs and, and pepper and things like that more than a salt substitute just because of that potassium concern. Okay, thank you. Uh, Schaefer, uh, a lot of questions about blood pressure. Um, what's the best time of day to measure your blood pressure? And this one individual really wants this answer. Uh, he or she, I can't remember if it was he or she, um, he, he or she has a high systolic blood pressure, but a low diastolic you know for everyone you always hear your blood pressure like 120 over 80 systolic is the higher one and sometimes one's good and one's high so um you're you're pretty much a hospitalist these days uh what do you, what do you have to say to that what's what's the best time to measure yeah so honestly your blood pressure is kind of like your blood sugar right it's going to be different all throughout the day sometimes people have higher blood pressures in the morning sometimes they have higher ones in the evening depends on what you eat Depends on if you exercise, depends on if you're stressed. So there's a lot of factors that can play into your blood pressures. So the best thing to do is check it at different times. Now you don't need to check it five, seven times a day, but you know, if you get yourself a, a home blood pressure monitor, you know, I recommend checking it, you know, at maybe once a day, but at different times throughout the day for a week or so to get a really good idea of where your blood pressures are. Check it in the morning when you first wake up, check it before lunch one day, check it before dinner, check it before you go to bed, because you may find that it, that it fluctuates throughout the day. So there's not really a one best time. Um, that, that's, that's my best advice in terms of when to check it. And you, you know, if you get one of these home blood pressure monitors, you know, just like everything in life, they're not perfect. And, and if you, you know, my dad got one at one point, he was checking his blood, blood pressure all the time and he would put it on his left arm, he'd check it. He'd put it on his right arm, he'd check it and they'd be off by like 10 or 20 points. And then he put it back on the left arm and it'd be off again. You know, it's going to be a little bit different every time, but we want to see what the trend is, right? So are you normally running high? Are your blood pressures 140, 160, over 100? It's too high. Is it normally less than 120 over 80 throughout the day? Then you're, then you're looking really good. 130 over, over 80 is a, is a great place to be too. So, so it's really the trend. Um, in terms of having a high systolic blood pressure, so where they don't match it up, maybe you have a high systolic blood pressure and a low diastolic blood pressure. So one of them is at goal, the other one's not. In that, in that situation, I would still be worried about it. And I would still say your blood pressure is too high. So the systolic blood pressure, that top number, is basically when your heart's pushing the blood out into the bloodstream. So it's that heartbeat, that pump, and it's pushing that blood out into your body. And then as the, um, as the heart relaxes, the blood vessels then will contract and, and keep that blood moving. And that's the, that's the diastolic. So there are two different time points in the heartbeat. But if your systolic blood pressure is too high, that's the pressure that your heart is like pushing against. So, so I still think that would be a concern and you may consider adjusting your medications or your diet to try to bring that number down. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jennifer. I, I saw this question and I don't even know if there isn't a, a correct answer, but 
is there such thing as a diabetic friendly fruit like for snacking? Hmm. Hmm. Well, you know, I always go with the motto, all foods can fit. Um, I think all fruits basically are friendly, um, you know, because of the benefits of fiber and antioxidants. Um, they all have different vitamins and minerals. However, I would, I would say if you're looking, if you're trying to think about a fruit, maybe a fruit that isn't going to increase your blood sugar as high as another one. Again, we know it's the total amount of carbohydrate over weed at one time, right? That increases our post meal blood sugar. But the berries come to mind, um, raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, because they are higher in fiber. And we typically see they may not, you may not have as high of a, a peak with those versus let's say a banana that is um, very ripe. Um, we see we a higher peak with that. A banana, however, that is not ripe, that's almost green, it's not going to raise your blood sugar as high post meal. Yeah, if you eat the banana with the green outer shell, it's really low. Yeah, so that, that's, that, that's the key right there, like a coconut with the um, outside. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's, you know, I think I th fruits are great. And as you know, like the Mediterranean plant-based eating patterns, they want a significant amount of those um, space throughout the day. But berries, like we have huckleberries in Montana. Right now they're out, they're great. So. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, for me, the blueberries affect my blood sugar the least. Uh, right. So bananas jack it up like crazy. Okay, Schaefer, um, some of the individuals were saying, what about those fancy uh, cholesterol tests where you get the particle size and all these measurements? Uh, it's, they're very expensive and the doctor recommended to pay out of pocket for it. Maybe you can explain that to the folks, what, what I'm talking about, what that question was about. Yeah, the, the traditional, you know, lipid panel that probably 99% of the time we order um, has sort of those cholesterols we talked about. You'll get your total cholesterol, which is everything smushed together, your LDL, your HDL, and your triglyceride. Sometimes it'll have a non-HDL uh, non cholesterol, which is everything but the HDL. So it's kind of like that's like a bad cholesterol group. Beyond that, there are, there are a number of more advanced tests, and um, one of them are the particle size, so LDL particle size. And um, the science behind that is that you can have big LDL, small LDL, all these different types of LDL, and some of those are worse for you than others. We actually, we, we, we test those on the research side when we're looking at, you know, effects of, of new medications um, on specific markers of heart disease. And we want to see really detailed down, you know, what are these doing, what are these medications doing, you know, how do we, how does this affect the cardiac risk? So these, these do have a role. But in, in, most, in most cases, um, first of all, you have to know how to interpret them. That's probably the most important thing. So if your doctor you know, is a cardiologist and uses these tests and maybe wants to check them once to make sure that they match up with your other cholesterol levels, then that can be useful. If, you know, if you're paying out of pocket for these, for these tests and it's not affecting your management, you're not getting different medications, it's not really changing what you're doing, they don't add a lot of other information. So it, so it's a tough question to answer, you know, how much is it worth paying for the extra test when you're going to get 90% of the information just on your normal cholesterol level? In most cases, we don't order them. Um, so it, it's, you know, if you're on the right medications and your LDL is low, you're at goal, then you're, you're pretty much there. If you want to get that a one-time test and you, and you feel comfortable with the cost of it, then it may give you a little more information. Okay. Thank you, Schaefer. Um, Jennifer, this is, this is a, an important question, I think. Um, a lot of questions about uh, artificial sweeteners and um, what is the best one? Are any of them dangerous? And to add on to that question, someone asked about monk, so something that holds monk in it, M-O-N-K, that it has a lot of sugar alcohol and can you subtract that? You know, I always get confused when they say it has sugar alcohol. I wanna know if it comes in a bourbon flavor, uh, but other than that, I don't know what to do with that sugar alcohol thing. Yeah, and, and there's a complicated kind of form that you can use with subtracting out sugar alcohols. It's typically about half um, because there is, I mean, there's some carbohydrate in sugar alcohol. And actually, I've, in just one of the recent research studies I read, actually said that typically when somebody uses a sugar alcohol, um, because it's half as sweet, a lot of times you use about twice as much. So they don't really know if you're really getting the savings with the sugar when you use that. And plus there's all those nasty gastrointestinal side effects um, that can happen with it. Um, you know, I know the monk, I think is like the monk fruit and that has just kind of been a recent um, kind of um, 
you know, if that, um, there's, I just don't really know of any research on that and I haven't seen a lot of folks using it. So I, I can't really guide you with that one, but, um, you know, I think we, we go to the stevia, the Truvia, those types um, have been shown to be the safest of all sugar substitutes. All of them are safe. Um, there are a few conditions, for example, if you have, you know, phenyl ketonuria, you can't use, you know, the, the aspartame and that type of thing. But, and there's been some issues, we can have some questions about Splenda, but overall, again, these are high doses that are given like to rats that are way over what any of us would ever think to consume. So they are safe, but again, make sure that you're not compensating, like I said, that Diet Coke with a side of French fries, because then you're really not getting the benefit of it. Yeah, I, I like Splenda personally, and I, the FDA has the maximum amount you can take per day. I forgot there's a name for that, but it's like 110 yeah. packets a day is safe. Yeah, yeah. I, I hardly ever use more than 105, so I'm going to get that right now. I don't. Okay, Schaefer, um, these, new di these new drugs that protect your heart and good for diabetes, the classes you've been talking about, uh, the question was, do they cause low blood sugar? Can they cause low blood sugar? And do they, would, if you're on insulin, would you need to lower that if those medications get added? Yeah, good question. So, so the SGLT2 class and the GLP-1 class, um, it, you know, the whole list of benefits, they good for the heart, they lower your blood sugars, but they do not that by themselves cause hypoglycemia. So the, these are not medications that have the ability to lower your blood sugar below the normal amount. So they cannot really cause low blood sugars by themselves. But of course, if you're taking another medication like insulin, that, that can, can cause low blood sugars, or if you're on a sulfonylurea like glipizide or something like that, if you have type 2 diabetes, you know, these medications can cause low blood sugars. And if you add anything to it that's going to make your blood glucose control lower at baseline or better, then those other medications can cause lows. So in general, if you're starting off with really pretty good blood sugar control, let's say on insulin and you add to it an SGLT2 or a GLP-1, then you're probably going to want to reduce your insulin doses a little bit. Um, and certainly the same could be for the sulfonylureas. Now, if your blood sugar is, control is not where you want it and you're taking insulin or sulfonylurea or other medications and, you're, and you add to it the GLP-1 or the SGLT-2, then you might be good. It might bring you down to the right place. So the answer is no, they don't cause lows, but they certainly can contribute to low blood sugars caused by other medications. Yeah, and don't forget to check with your doctor before you lower your dose of anything or increase the dose. Um, Schaefer has a good lawyer, though, so no, no worries. Um, okay, Jennifer, last question for you, and I have one more for you, Schaefer, if we have time. Um, there, is, uh, there was a question about someone who is on a super, super low fat diet, like almost zero. Is that safe? Is it bad for you? Uh, and is hydrogenated oil is good as partially hydrogenated oil. And I don't really know the difference personally myself either. Okay, yeah. Well, um, if we go to the, the super low fat, you know, the, the, guide, the guidance from the American Diabetes Association and the re that recent consensus statement was about 20 to 35% of your calories should be from fat. I wouldn't recommend going much less than 20%. Um, because we have, our body does have like basic needs for fat. I mean, we, you know, for there's a variety as we know, a metabolic processes that fat plays a role in. And so then we could have certainly like our hair can fall out our skin, all those kinds of things. Um, besides we, I mean, we could, we could die if we don't, if we don't have enough fat that just has a protective mechanism. It's the type of fat that we choose that really matters. And that's where there's a big focus on looking at the type of fat right now and what the benefit is. So, you know, there's like the Ornish and Pritikin diets that are out there and they're very low fat, but they still have some. They, they, have, they don't go down to zero and they're, they're, they have been effective. And there is, is one study that shows basically versus a low carb diet of the year, they were as effective at maintaining weight loss. But when it comes to um, lowering triglycerides, they are not as effective. So they are also effectively low in LDL cholesterol, but also HDL is affected negatively. So a little bit of that mono and polyunsaturated fat, at least to, to 20% is where you want to go um, and to have those positive also metabolic effects. Um, as far as partially hydrogenated and hydrogenated, they're both hydrogenated and you're taking something liquid and you're making it a solid. And when you do that um, synthetically, man-made, then you're looking at that uh, profile of um, 
lowering that good cholesterol HDL and increase that LDL. And that's, there's a lot of damage with that. Um, so that, that hard Crisco oil that comes is not good for you? So that's a good question. So there's, there's that modification factor. There's still, um, it's not, if you're comparing that to olive oil, there's no question you want to do the olive oil. They have taken a lot of the uh, trans fats out of that process, but there's still, there's still that hydrogenation, which if you look at your fats, it's going to be right there on the butter, or probably worse than the butter arm um, in doing that. And, and not the butter's bad. Everything, nothing's bad, right? It's a whole moderation piece. But um, yeah, yeah, partially hydrogen or hydrogenated, if it's man-made, you really want to limit those um, to as little as possible. Thank you. Okay, Schaefer, can you answer this in 30 seconds or less? Because it's 5.30 now. Um, what's the one or two liners on blood thinners and people with diabetes? aspirin and some of the stronger ones yeah so um aspirin you know we covered that pretty well if you if if you have diabetes and heart disease think about being on a baby aspirin unless you have a reason not to in other words some type of bleeding issue the other medications the stronger ones like plavix or these other medications really tend to go along with people who have who have had heart attacks who have stents put in who have other reasons to be on those medications. Generally, if you're on one of those stronger blood thinners, you generally don't also take an aspirin, although there are some exceptions. In that case, you want to talk to your cardiologist who would be managing those medications. But um, we don't generally prescribe those stronger blood thinners because they have more risk of bleeding, that sort of thing, for, for just for prevention. So it's only if you've had a heart attack or stent or something like that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, calling in from Missoula, Montana, and Schaefer from uh, the shores of San Diego. Um, I want to remind everybody that <clears throat> if you asked a question in the last 30 minutes, I was paying attention here, we will answer them on our website when we post the recording of this uh, Spotlight series. Uh, the Don't forget, October 3rd is our next huge conference for people with type 1, but anybody can attend. There will be should be a lot of fun lectures there. Um, uh, and don't forget, a week from tomorrow is our Facebook Live on diabetic retinopathy, macular edema. We're going to be interviewing uh, a very uh, superb diabetes eye specialist. And so with that, uh, the health fair is open for at least 30 minutes, and the exhibitors may stick around if they're crowded. So you guys um, enjoy yourself. And Schaefer and uh, Jennifer, thank you once again.